and you'll be able to see everyone on the team. I'm Mikhail Shabako, program coordinator. We're joined by Gregory Simpson, who is one of the senior Clean Power Fellows at NYCP, uh, Jen Metzger, former state senator and senior policy advisor. Um, and then we have Cal Truman, who is a climate education Clean Power Fellow. Andrew Pizzullo, who's also a Clean Power Fellow at NYCP. And of course, everyone knows our campaign director, Fed Abroad. So uh, without further ado, if we could start with some of the slides. And as we're getting those up, you can access the chat, I believe, and also put your questions in the Q&A um, so that we can make sure and make sure those make sure those are make sure those are still. And um, we'll have maybe 20 or 15 minutes towards the end to answer questions. We also have a follow-up questionnaire that is really short, I promise. It is a Google form, but it's a short one. And we just would like your feedback. So this is our Green the Grid Electrify Everything presentation. Again, we're launching it um, as we will start doing these presentations across the state. And we would welcome your feedback and questions since we um, want to know what would be helpful for a group in your area to know um, about transitioning New York's economy to clean electricity, renewable electricity, and um, making sure that all of our buildings and transportation are also running on electric, um, all electric power. So New Yorkers for Clean Power is a nonprofit campaign that is focused on transitioning our economy to um, all electric um, renewable power. And we do a lot of education and outreach around electric vehicles, solar power, wind power, uh, clean heating and cooling and energy efficiency, as well as supporting um, good paying clean energy jobs. And as some of you may have already met, we have Clean Power Fellows on the presentation today that are working in uh, communities to educate people about renewable energy and energy efficiency solutions and clean transportation solutions and um, trying to get more support groups for renewable power in across the state and be aware of the New York State climate goals all of which will go into deep, into more depth throughout the presentation. Um, next slide. And so I will hand it off to Gregory Simpson, who is again, our uh, senior clean power fellow, also a pastor at um, the, oh, Noren Shah, yeah. Noren <laughs> So take it away, Gregory. Thank you. Thank you. And Thanks. thank you all for being here. Um, in, so we're going to start with, with what fossil fuels are. And it's in their basic, most basic terms. Fossil fuels are, are the remains of dead organic life, such as plants or shellfish, uh, which collect and build up over, over millions of years. Um, these life forms breathe, eat, and store carbon while they are alive. And then are compressed in the earth, storing the carbon with them when they die. When fossil fuels are dug up and burned, those millions of years worth of carbon are rapidly released back into the atmosphere. Uh, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have been rising dramatically since the Industrial Revolution. And I think, um, hmm, uh, and that, of course, ushered in a widespread commercial use of fossil fuels. And I think one of the things in, 19, in 1821, just an interesting side note, William Hart dug the first natural gas well of the Industrial Revolution in the village of Fredona, New York in 1858. And the Fredona Gas Light Company became the first American natural gas company. And in many ways, that started the problem right here uh, in New York State. As the fossil fuels burn or have been burning, that has increased the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases uh, in the atmosphere. 
And as a result of that, the temperature of the earth has actually gone up. Even with a rapid decrease in atmospheric greenhouse gases, and this is really important, elevated temperatures and extreme weather patterns uh, will continue to get worse before they get better. This graph kind of demonstrates some of that where there's an, the, the carbon dioxide concentration over a period of time has rapidly increased. And you can see that exponential increase on, that, on, that, on the graph. It is these elevated or these relationships more specifically between greenhouse gases and elevated global temperature and the unprecedented swings in weather pattern that are driving the need to eliminate the use of fossil fuels as quickly as possible. And as greenhouse, gases concentra greenhouse gas concentrations increase in the atmosphere, these extremes in, in frequency and intensity uh, of global warming, it, the rapid, the shift between them continue to go. Um, and this is what we see as, as being, well, it's obviously, this is for very, very, very dangerous and nothing that we want to have happen. Next slide. There are obviously numerous examples around the globe that we can talk to, which we can draw on to demonstrate how global warming has influenced and changed our environment. But we want to just touch on, on two. Um, hot temperature extremes over land have in some ways fueled uh, all kinds of uh, events, one of which is wildlife fires. And we saw that uh, earlier in the year in Oregon on the West Coast, which interestingly led to red and orange smoke hazes seen in New York, in Washington, in Baltimore, in Philadelphia, and in Boston on the East Coast. So this is one uh, area where elevated temperatures spark, trigger something on one side of the country and lead to a consequence on the other side of the country. Another example of this is uh, the high water precipitation patterns that occur over land. And that has led to flooding, for example, from Hurricane Irene in, uh, and specifically in Wyndham County, Vermont in 2011, and more recently in 2021, where over 20 inches of rain saturated the ground and caused widespread damages in uh, Widham County, uh, Vermont. Of course, we can also talk about things like agriculture and ecological drought patterns and drying in drying regions, as well as increased tropical diseases in temperate regions and the list goes on. As far as one of the other things that we can we can speak to across numerous, numerous examples of it um, in, in across a, a myriad of platforms, the EPA, uh, where they've discussed sources and solutions for fossil fuels, uh, the Reuters, which demonstrates a number of areas where there have been problems and the list goes on. Let's go to the next slide. As one of the consequences, we know a problem that occurs. Air and water pollution lead to dangerous health problems and disproportionately affect the poor and people of color. And many, many health conditions are connected to fossil fuel related air pollution, such as respiratory, respiratory diseases, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis, cardiovascular diseases, such as, uh, as well as birth defects and stroke cancers, breast cancer, such as breast cancer and lung cancer and lymphoma, um, a myriad of child illnesses, such as asthma and ADHD and degenerative nervous system disorders, such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Um, the very old and the very young, as well as anyone living in areas uh, where elevated air pollution exists are particularly susceptible to the detrimental health effects of air pollution. And communities adjacent to power plants or, or petroleum pr processing plants tend to be poor and non-white, making fossil fuel generated air pollution critical environmental justice issue. Beyond air pollution from fossil 
uh, fossil fuel combustion, fossil fuel extraction through mining and fracking, uh, uh, pollutes land and waterways, and is also associated with negative health outcomes like nerve damage, vision loss, premature birth, anemia, and damage to liver and kidneys, and so many other problems health-wise. One of the other things that we can talk about, and you'll hear more about this, for example, the transportation of fossil fuels can also pose major public health and public safety risk factors when traveling through different populated areas. Um, one study, uh, in kind of to wrapping up, one of the studies, uh, a research study done in Kentucky coal plants found that as plants shut down or install population controls, asthma symptoms in the surrounding area drop precipitously with inhaler use falling by up to 17% within the first few, few months. So working quickly to transition off of fossil fuel will make an immediate difference in the health of the state's most vulnerable uh, populations. And we're really, really striving really hard to achieve that goal with programs like these. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gregory. And we'll now hear from Jen Metzger, former state senator and our senior policy advisor to talk about some of the state's goals and plans for action. Thanks, Mick. And thanks, Gregory. Um, you really sort of teed this up with the incredible challenges that we face. Um, uh, I, hi, everyone. Um, I, you know, had the great fortune of of serving in the state Senate at this really historic moment for climate policy in New York. Um, I was an active member of the Senate's working group um, that developed New York's climate law, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which was um, the most ambitious climate law in the country when we passed it in 2019. And I'm pretty sure it still is, or certainly among, among the most ambitious. Um, in fact, actually, President Biden looked to New York's law as a model um, in some respects, particularly in its emphasis on environmental justice and social equity. Um, the law requires that New York reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% below 1990 levels by 2030, uh, just less than nine years from now, to put it in perspective. Um, and achieve um, net zero emissions of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Um, next slide. On- Sorry on about the, that. Oops, it's, it's okay. Um, on the electricity side, um, we're required to generate 70% of our electricity from renewable sources by 2030 and have an entirely carbon-free system by 2040. Um, so these are um, ambitious goals, just to give you a sense. Um, we were only generating between four and 5% of our electricity from when, when wind and solar when we passed this law. Um, and we're at about 27% when you counted um, New York's existing hydropower. Um, but we are actually already making great progress toward meeting our renewable energy target, but it's, you know, we have a lot of work to do. Um, as Gregory pointed out, you know, achieving a just and equitable clean energy transition is absolutely critical. Um, and this is a major goal of New York's climate law. We have to make sure that disadvantaged communities are not left behind. Low-income communities and communities of color that, as Gregory um, described, showed us are have been disproportionately impacted by environmental pollution and the other costs of our fossil system. Uh, the law, New York's climate law, requires that at least 35% of the benefits of clean energy investments go to disadvantaged communities with the goal of at least 40%. Um, so, so how are we going to achieve these ambitious climate goals? Um, the law created a 22 member climate action council that is responsible for developing the plan to meet New York's targets. Um, it also, the law also created an environmental justice working group comprised of representatives from environmental justice community, 
communities across the state to advise the Climate Action Council and make sure we're meeting our equity goals. It also created a just transition working group, um, which is very important as we shift to clean, a clean energy system. Um, you know, those workers, workers that have been impacted by that transition, you know, we have to train them, we have to support them um, to enter uh, new green job careers. Um, so the, the clean, just give you a sense of where we are now, the, the, clean, the, the Climate Action Council and working groups have been meeting for over a year now. Um, advisory panels were created in specific areas like housing, transportation, power generation, and, and they have made recommendations in their, their particular areas of expertise. And the council and these advisory panels have also been get holding public input sessions as well. Um, actually, there's happens to be a climate action council meeting tomorrow, which you can watch online. Um, and I recommend doing it. Um, you can just Google New York Climate Action Council and get to the page with the link for the meeting. Um, so New York's climate action plan is being actively developed and it's required by law to be completed by 2022. Um, there'll be a series of statewide or, or hearings across the state on the draft plan. Um, I imagine beginning early in the new year and I strongly encourage folks to participate in a hearing near you. Um, once the plan is finalized, regulations will be developed based on the plan to get us to our targets. Um, but just just as uh, I just want to add that you know it's it's not like everything is on hold while we're waiting for for the council to complete this its work. Um, we face a climate crisis and don't have the time to wait. And there is a lot that the state can be doing now um, that our communities can be doing now. And in fact, many things the state and our communities are already doing to shift to a clean energy system. Um, so next slide. Um, so what exactly does that shift involve? <laughs> um, one of the most important ways we can reach our climate goals is to use less e electricity. Energy efficiency can include sealing up drafty buildings, investing in uh, energy star appliances, upgrading street lights. Um, basically the cleanest energy, uh, the, the cleanest energy we use is, is energy we don't use <laughs> at all, and it's also the cheapest. Um, we also have to green the grid, as I mentioned, and this will involve investments in everything from rooftop solar and community solar to larger um, solar and on and offshore wind projects. Um, and finally, we have to shift from fossil fuel burning technologies that we use every day uh, to zero emissions electricity-based technologies like electric vehicles, heat pumps to heat our buildings in hot water and induction stoves for cooking. And this is what we mean by beneficial electric electrification. It's electricity-based technologies rather than technologies requiring fossil fuel combustion. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the, this slide um, gives you a sense of where our emissions are coming from in New York um, and the priority areas we really need to focus on. Um, transportation is, is the biggest source of emissions, but buildings are um, a very close second. Um, the electricity sector uh, is quite, quite a bit smaller, but could get a lot bigger unless we green the grid as we shift to beneficial electrification in these other sectors, in transportation and buildings. Um, and that is why, um, next slide. That is why NYCP is focused on these three most important sectors, transportation, buildings, and electricity, and, and the electricity sector, and why we must green the grid and electrify everything. <laughs> so now I'm going to turn it over to Cal, I believe, to talk about transportation. Thank you. I'm gonna set myself a timer. Um, so transportation is, I'm Cal, by the way. 
transportation is the most significant source of greenhouse gases in both the state and the country. Um, that includes passenger autos, uh, public transit, air travel, and shipping of goods. So anything that moves from one place to another counts as uh, transportation emissions. Um, and access to low carbon transportation is spread pretty unevenly in different regions of New York State. Uh, for example, in New York City, 60% of uh, commuters rely on public transit, but in the rest of the state, you've got 75% of New Yorkers um, rely, uh, driving to work alone in, uh, in their own car. So it's pretty, it varies, it varies. Um, so every, uh, all 62 counties and many municipalities have their own regional bus or light rail service, some of which is already electric. And uh, Amtrak and Metro North provide longer haul rail to parts of the state, uh, but by and large, New Yorkers travel and commute by personal car. So as a result, 82% of transportation emissions in New York state come from light duty personal vehicles, um, which is typically cars or pickup trucks. So I know for me, when I look at the road, I think you know a dump truck or a tractor trailer, like that's where the big emissions are coming from, but that's not actually a very large percentage of the travel on the road we're really looking at passenger vehicles um, as the primary source of emissions. So that's your personal car, your pickup truck. So there's a couple of ways to address these issues. One is shared transportation, whether that's a car share like the Ithaca car share or a bike share or electric bike share, um, such as ready bikes in Buffalo. Being able to access shared cars um, reduces members' reliance on a personal vehicle and also offers the convenience of occasional car usage to folks who prefer not to own a vehicle or can't own a vehicle. Whereas um, bike shares or electric bikes can help close the uh, last mile gap, um, which is the difference between maybe where you live and where mass transit hubs are. So if you're two miles from a train station, that's maybe not a reasonable walk in the morning, but it might be a reasonable bike ride. So that's one of the ways that um, having access to a bike can help. If, uh, if and when private vehicles are necessary, whether that's for personal use or for commercial or municipal fleets, electric vehicles um, and other zero emission vehicles are an increasingly feasible option. So in this photo, we've got um, electric vehicles from a bunch of major automakers Essentially, every major automaker on the planet is rolling out their own um, version of an electric vehicle at this point, um, especially for what we're talking about with the uh, light duty vehicles. So whether that's these kinds of cars or, for example, the Ford F-150 is the number one selling automobile in the United States. And the F-150 Lightning, which is the electric version of that, has absolutely smashed every pre-sale projection. They've got so many pre-orders that they're hiring tens of thousands of new workers and opening a new factory. So that's uh, green jobs we'll talk about later, but building electric vehicles is a green job. Um, municipalities can, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, when you power these electric vehicles by low or no carbon electricity, such as renewables, um, EVs have a huge potential to cut emissions by minimizing or eliminating ongoing fossil fuel usage. And municipalities can encourage adoption of EVs by either or both installing charging stations and by uh, electrifying municipal fleets. So your police cars, for example, can be um, electric vehicles. There is grant funding for both of those things as well as for electrifying um, heavier duty vehicles such as maintenance trucks, um, school buses, uh, so those are things to keep in mind that the state does want to um, help municipalities um, undertake those objectives and there's grant funding to do it. One of the things people talk about um, in relation to EVs is the issue of uh, range anxiety. So being worried that they won't be able to travel far enough to get where they need to go. As you can see, the state is full of charging stations, places to uh, plug in your car, even if you're not in your home. Um, there are places where that's denser and less dense, but any municipality can install a charging station and that will help people who have electric vehicles know that they can come to your municipality, charge their car, walk around, get a cup of coffee, um, spend some time and money in your town. 
Um, the state does have a goal of reaching net zero vehicular emissions by 2050. And so adding uh, charging capability is one of the ways we're going to um, bring down vehicular emissions to meet that target. Um, of course, electric vehicles alone cannot solve the climate crisis. Um, on the policy side, congestion pricing, a price on emissions, sometimes called a carbon tax, uh, and shifting vehicle registration and insurance fees so they're pay paid based on vehicle mileage instead of uh, time um, can all discourage personal car use when other modes of transit are available. So I believe um, Betta is going to explain some of the policy and legislative priorities for transportation. Um, is that right? I can. I think also we can just, you know, mention very quickly because it is already 1.30 and uh, we wanna be sure to have time for you know, questions and input at the end. Uh, I'll just you know, reiterate that this is kind of a practice run of this presentation, which we hope to bring to community groups and um, you know, organizations and folks that are not necessarily clued in to what's happening with the clean energy transition. So as you're watching this, if you can kind of look at it with those eyes and, and help us identify how we can make this high level you know, overview really clear for people. And so I don't wanna to get too into the weeds right now uh, with some of our you know, individual policy and legislative priorities, but I uh, would just invite people to visit um, nyfortci.org, uh, which is a website of a campaign that we're a part of to get New York State to join the Transportation and Climate Initiative, uh, which would reduce transportation related emissions across the region and also raise a lot of much needed funding so that we can invest in clean transportation solutions. Uh, and we're going to be having another uh, online teach-in in November, uh, early November, really focusing on some of the exciting projects across the state that we could be investing in uh, with TCI funds. And, and then some of the other bills that we're supporting, um, the Green Transit and Green Jobs Bill, we're, look, we're working with the Electrify New York Coalition to advance that. Um, the ACT uh, bill and rules, that's really exciting. Governor Hochul actually is just moving forward uh, on that. And there's gonna be some hearings we'll alert people to in early November, uh, the direct EV sales bill, enabling um, more, you know, Tesla for instance, wants to open more showrooms in New York state and is currently not able to, they're limited to five. Uh, so we wanna change that so we can really expand the EV market in New York state. And then electric school bus bill um, really is speaking to the need for more funding so that more school districts can purchase electric school buses uh, for their fleets because uh, they are more expensive, um, you know, initially, but obviously have um, is the direction that we need to go in. And so we need to support school districts in that. And, and we can definitely do a deeper dive into these policies uh, in the future. But I think, you know, right now we're uh, aiming to give this kind of high level overview of how we need to green the grid and electrify everything. So I think we can now shift uh, over to the building sector from the transportation sector. Uh, you know, the building sector is, um, you know, if not equal to transportation, uh, when you think about how most electricity is actually used to power buildings, um, you know, it is undeniably the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that's our building sector. So next slide. Uh, so we need to decarbonize, right? And there's a lot of different aspects of decarbonization and, and especially equitable decarbonization because we wanna make sure that everyone in New York State is able to transition off fossil fuels and benefit from energy efficiency and, and renewable energy. And so some of the aspects of building decarbonization that I wanna to touch on are, you can see in the picture, um, weatherization, right? So we wanna make sure that we are having a tight building envelope, air sealing, insulation, really critical uh, that you know buildings aren't losing um, through air leaks. They're, you know, the heat and, and, um, and cool uh, air in the, in the summer. So if you do have a tighter building envelope, 
Um, you are able to reduce your energy bills and also have a much more comfortable home. So investing in weatherization and also energy efficiency, uh, that might mean new windows, it might mean new uh, lighting, LEDs, all of that can save money and also reduce your greenhouse gas emissions uh, in your home. And then, you know, the other really key part of building decarbonization that I want to talk about is electrification. So once again, electrify everything, including the building sector, uh, and we're going to do that with heat pumps. So that picture is a uh, commercial uh, air source heat pumps uh, on the roof of a big building. Um, next slide. Uh, we also have air source heat pumps that people are using in their homes, including me. Uh, <laughs> which is why I set up here in my in my kitchen so you can see uh, how great air source heat pumps are not only in the picture on the screen but also uh, behind me and the great thing about air source heat pumps and ground source uh, next slide are that they provide uh, not only heating so it's how we're going to transition our buildings from being heated with fossil fuels uh, which is how most buildings, unfortunately, in New York State are being heated. Uh, it's going to enable us to get off fossil fuels for heating and also cooling. That's the other great benefit. So, you know, unfortunately, as Gregory talked about, um, we're seeing, you know, more and more extreme weather and rising temperatures. And in the not too distant future, um, most New Yorkers are going to need air conditioning. And so that air cooling can be provided by heat pumps, which is really great. And I love this picture because it just sort of, you know, is the fantasy uh, that we wanna make a reality of a home that is utilizing a geothermal system for heating and cooling. They have solar panels for their electricity. They have an electric vehicle charging up and then in the distance, a uh, wind turbine, uh, which my colleague Andrew is gonna get into in a minute. Uh, but next slide, please. So we've got a ton of policy and legislative priorities that I could get into on the building sector. So I'm just gonna you know, very briefly mention a, a few right now. Um, and also want to draw your attention to the little cartoon there, which shows uh, <laughs> a little guy, a little pot guy enjoying the induction stove, uh, which I also happen to have. I'm very fortunate in that. Um, I'm not all electric yet here. I still don't have an electric dryer um, or hot water system yet, but definitely looking next to invest in a uh, hot water heat pump, which I know Jen uh, just got or is getting. And so, you know, it, it, it's a transition that is going to take a little time. It's hard to just like wave a magic wand and, you know, get heat pumps and an induction stove and a dryer and the hot water system and the electric vehicle. Um, you know, of course, all of this takes, you know, money and, and, uh, it's something that we're really working on is to make these technologies more affordable for people and make the financing um, more accessible. And that's definitely something we've been working on at the federal level with pushing so that uh, the Build Back Better bill has really robust funding for green affordable housing, helping people uh, decarbonize their buildings and invest in these technologies so that they can have all electric heating and, and appliances. And then at the state level, we're you know, pushing for the adoption of the Advanced Building Codes Appliance and Equipment Efficiency Standards Act, uh, which passed the um, Senate this last session um, and got stalled out in the assembly, but we're going to uh, pick up where we left off in this next legislative season and make sure that gets adopted so we have the most ambitious um, appliance standards and also improve our building codes, um, which eventually is going to get us to all electric building codes, basically a ban on fossil fuel systems. So uh, we are advocating that beginning in 2024, we stop installing um, fossil fuel systems in new construction. Uh, this might again have to be a phased approach with some, you know, bigger buildings maybe taking a little bit longer. And then eventually, um, you know, for replacement systems, uh, we will also be requiring all electric as a state. And so that's the direction we're going in, but we need to keep pushing the envelope uh, for the solutions and, and for our all electric future to begin as soon as possible. 
And at the same time that we're pushing for the solutions and making them more affordable and accessible, we also need to stop subsidizing fossil fuels and stop digging, right? Uh, so that's another aspect of this work that we're really committed to and look forward to, to keep building the movement with all of our allies uh, to shift away from fossil fuels and, and make sure we're not socializing the costs of expanding the gas system you know, on ratepayers. So there's so much more I could say about this, but uh, I think we need to move on to the next sector, uh, which is the power sector, the electricity sector. And I will pass the baton to Andrew. Thanks, Beda. Um, let me just set my timer. So I'm gonna speed through a bunch of stuff and I think it'll be interesting. Thanks everyone for all the feedback thus far, but I'll be interested to hear you know, if I hit everything and if it's high level enough or if it's too jargony, but um, all right, cool. So electricity sector, you know, it's, a, it's the third largest source of emissions in New York, but uh, it doesn't make it um, NYCP's third priority in terms of decarbonization. It's like absolutely essential that we get the grid transition right. Um, electricity is about, this is an old number. I don't think it accounts for, um, you know, um, our sort of increasing understanding of, of methane emissions as well. But, you know, electricity is 15% of current emissions. Um, and I, I want to like sort of double down on this point. It's, it's come up a couple of times, but you know, if we don't move to a renewable emissions-free grid, you know, all the other things we just talked about, the heat pumps and the electric cars, all the facets of a decarbonized economy will be forced to run on dirty fuel sources and actually in many ways run the risk of, of, of increasing emissions uh, economy-wide. So that's kind of a, the stakes of, of the electricity generation sector. So um, you can stay on the slide for a sec. Um, these are basically the big three, wind, solar, and hydropower. We have a lot of legacy hydropower, actually most of our existing renewables, um, but there's not a lot of new waterways in New York um, left to sort of sustainably tap for hydropower. A lot of the hydropower is, is, is as old as a hundred years, um, but still makes up a core of our electricity generation. Most of the new renewables to be developed in New York are solar and wind. Uh, you can next slide. So this is a diagram from NISA, which is the New York Independent System Operator. This is their 2020 power trends report. They're basically the folks who sort of determine how electricity moves around the grid. Um, uh, as of 2020, New York's electric grid relied on renewable energy for about 25% of its needs. So that's the big blue bar and then the two little green bars to the left and right of it. Um, the tiny green bars, um, you know, are all the wind and solar in New York. The, the forest green bar is actually considered other renewables and solar is embedded in that. So it's not even, solar isn't even 2% of renewables in New York currently. So, you know, assuming hydro kind of stays the same, we have to grow the solar and wind bars a lot. And just hearkening back to what Jen was talking about, you know, in terms of targets, the big green bar that's on the outside, you know, that says zero emissions, that needs to go to 100%. And our renewables, um, so that's the um, hydropower, wind, and solar, need to move from 25% right now to 70%. So we do have a fair bit of ways to go. So next slide. Um, this is um, also from NISO, and it shows how the grid can be broken up into upstate and downstate grids, kind of. Um, it shows in the downstate uh, grid zones F through K, so that's like New York City and the Hudson Valley and Westchester, that, um, the need for renewables is pretty extreme. Right now we get most of our um, electricity from non-renewable sources. So, you know, kind of you can imagine it, but you can also see from this, um, you know, the way the grid is set up as well as the state, the way the state looks geographically very big and rural on top, kind of comes down to a bottleneck, that there are a lot of bottlenecks in our grid. So grid improvements like transmission lines being proposed and developed, they offer the opportunity for us to transition to a grid that's sort of well-balanced and, and, and kind of renewable throughout. Next slide. Um, this is sort of just a simple illustration about megawatts. Megawatts is what we talk about with solar and wind. You know, this project is X megawatts. Um, that's a million watts, which equals a thousand kilowatts, which equals one megawatt. One megawatt is, is like 10,000, you know, 100 watt light bulbs to um, produce one megawatt of power you need to build 3,500 solar panels, and that's enough to power somewhere around 160 homes in New York. So obviously these are big numbers. Um, it just kind of gets you thinking about, you know, how many houses, how many towns, 
um, how many businesses there are in New York and how many megawatts we need to, to sort of power all of it. Next slide. So this is a slide about hydro. You know, we have a lot of existing hydro, Niagara, St. Lawrence River, the Shokin. There is not a lot of political will or interest in you know, building any more large scale hydro, primarily because of its effects on aquatic ecosystems, you know, as well as human communities. Um, there is some interest in micro hydro, which you can kind of see in the, in the bottom corner, um, which is much better for fish and aquatic life. Um, next slide. So here's a slide about wind. Um, two types of wind, onshore and offshore. Um, our offshore targets for wind coming out of the CLCPA are 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035, which is quite ambitious. Um, the state has already approved about half of that off the coast of Long Island. So we're, we're halfway there in terms of approval. And you know something kind of very convenient about offshore wind is that it's located very close to downstate high population, high energy need areas. And it can go a long way to kind of, you know, take that tail of two grids thing and put them together to green that part of New York's grid. Um, just so you get a sense historically, you know, we've built 2000, we have 2000 megawatts of wind power in New York in the entire state. And that actually took about 20 years to sort of develop all those projects. So, you know, we need to be building, building faster. Um, there are no current targets for onshore wind other than just wanting to develop a lot of it in New York. Next slide. Um, solar, okay, so we have a target of 10,000 megawatts by 2025 for small scale solar. Um, so that's things like um, rooftops of, of homes and businesses, as well as community solar. We also need to build a lot of grid scale solar, um, but we'll get into that in a sec. Um, you know, just again, historically, we have 3000 megawatts of solar power installed. So again, like with wind, you know, um, solar has to be developed at much faster speeds um, than it is now for us to meet our goals. So there's a couple of ways to build solar. People probably know, you know, put solar on a roof, no need for, you know, big racks. The building is wired to accept the power from the panels, um, electrify the building um, and put the excess electricity back into our big grid. Um, this works on a residential home, a school, a hospital, a warehouse. We have a lot of these things in New York. So there's a lot of room for potential development. Uh, next slide. Another option is large scale um, ground mounted solar installation, usually located on rural lands. Um, you know, it needs a set of racks and posts to hold the solar up and also to hook up to, um, you know, transmission lines so that that power, all that big, you know, a lot of power um, goes directly into the grid. Um, it can be built in a lot of different places, uh, you know, a capped landfill, even in a floodplain where, you know, a house couldn't be built. Um, just quickly as an aside, you know, it, the most controversial thing about ground mounted solar is, is probably when it is sited on farmland um, because you know, we obviously need farmland for our rural economies, for food and fiber. Just a couple of things to consider. Um, you know, though we have to build a lot of solar by any estimation, even if we put a lot of it on farmland, it would take up a tiny fraction of New York State's farmland, something like 1%. Um, another thing is far, you know, farmers you know, renting a part of their land um, for solar have been able to keep their farms, you know, in their family and to, um, you know, keep their farms from being permanently developed by big box stores or homes. Um, ground mounted solar is removable. So, you know, usually after 20 years, um, it comes up and it doesn't permanently destroy farmland. And then finally, something, you know, I'm very excited about is there's a lot of ongoing work researching agrivoltaics, which is the idea of taking agricultural practices and putting them next to um, solar. So grazing sheep in a solar meadow. So many times solar and, and rural farmland can be a win-win. Next slide. You know, if you can't have solar on your roof, you know, maybe you rent or you have a lot of trees <laughs> above your roof. Um, there's a cool concept called community solar. It's a subscription program where panels go somewhere else and you're assigned panels that match, you know, your projected electricity needs. Um, then what gets produced by those panels gets delivered to the grid and gets applied to your bill as a discount. Uh, generally folks save about 10% um, as well as this encourages renewable energy for our grid. Um, next slide. Just quickly, this is you know, about energy storage, which is simply you know, sort of using big batteries um, to become a big part of our electrical grid in New York. These are lithium ion batteries. They can be deployed 
you know, next to large solar farms or wind farms, as well as you know, at, a, at a household scale in your garage or something like that. You know, at the grid scale, batteries offer reliability um, for you know, different times of day or different seasons um, when the sun or um, you know, wind output differs. Um, we've got targets for those as well in New York, 1500 megawatts of energy storage by 2025, 3000 megawatts by 2030. Not a lot has been built yet, but there is a lot of projects in development. Next slide. This is, um, yeah, just sort of so you get a sense geographically of where projects are. This is a not up-to-date map of where grid scale projects are. I know ACE, New York, who put this map together um, are working to update it right now. Next slide. I just have two more slides. So just, this is, you know, something to kind of be aware of. And I think probably a lot of people on the call have, have been I've noticed this or been a part of this, you know, sometimes um, when large scale wind or solar projects are proposed, a lot of times in rural communities, there's a lot of opposition from communities. Um, people call it NIMBYism, not in my backyard. There are a lot of different reasons for why people are opposed to projects. Um, you know, we, we organize around it and it's, it's important to consider, I think it's important to sort of try to understand why people are opposed, to be empathetic to those concerns, but also to you know, make an affirmative case as to why, you know, we need to build these projects for the state, but also that there are myriad economic and community benefits that can come from them. Next slide. To that end, we um, put out a toolkit it's called Building Our Clean Energy Future, toolkit for supporting wind and solar projects that does just that. Um, you know, it's kind of a primer, a how-to for um, community members who are maybe live in a community where a solar project is being considered to um, help them organize their neighbors, their friends, their community members, to engage with stakeholders, um, you know, local politicians, and um, to support projects. Next slide. And then finally, this is sort of just broadly about legislative priorities. I, I could be wrong, but my sense is, you know, we've, we've had some really good legislative wins for, for larger scale wind and solar, the CLCPA, the creation of the Office of Renewable Energy Siting, which improves the, the sort of siting process to, to build these projects. So really what we need to be doing now is, is supporting projects in every single community throughout the state. Next slide. Oh, I think that's it. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much, Andrew. That was a super thorough, uh, but also brief presentation. And that's what this is about. Uh, we're trying to give a high level uh, overview of what it's going to take to green the grid and electrify everything. And a really important part of this transition is green jobs. Uh, and actually there's a picture of Cal right there on the roof, uh, very uh, multi-talented individual uh, putting solar on there. Uh, but there's all different kinds of, you know, clean energy careers and green jobs that people can plug into. and. One of the uh, things that our New Yorkers for Clean Power fellows have been working on is this green jobs map, uh, which I'm going to put in a link in the chat. And that provide the, the page has a lot of different resources related to clean energy careers and jobs, and also this really cool map that our fellows have been working on that identifies all kinds of you know training opportunities around the state employers that are looking for uh, folks. I mean, we know uh, we're going to have to really scale up our workforce development and how we create these clean energy careers pathways in New York. So uh, we're, we're doing our, our little part here and would love your help in populating the map. There's a form that people can submit if you have uh, either a company or a, inst a training institution or school in your region that you want to highlight. Uh, so anyway, please check that out. Um, next slide. Uh, in addition to the incredible, you know, opportunities that this transition holds for job seekers uh, and young people, we also really want to encourage everybody to get involved uh, as a citizen activist, as a consumer. There are so many different ways to plug in, and one of the things that NYCP does is really highlight all of the great groups around the state that are working on this. Uh, we have a community calendar, so if you have an event happening. Uh, with your organization or in your region that you want to highlight, please 
post it to our calendar, uh, sign up for the mailing list so that you can find out about these like cool events that are happening uh, increasingly in person, yay, uh, but a lot online and, and connect to different take actions. There's petitions going on. Um, we have one right now on um, standardizing taxation for renewable energy projects. We highlight other groups, ways of taking action. So it's really a collaborative effort. And there's also ways that you can plug in in your local community. I serve on the Kingston Climate Smart Commission and Ulster Climate Smart Committee. And it's really great when you can con uh, connect with your local um, municipal leaders and, and also elected officials. So that's something that we also want to help channel if you're interested in getting involved at that level in contacting your state legislators um, joining a lobbying meeting legislative meeting in the future please uh, let us know and we will make that connection uh, next slide please uh, as a consumer, if you're interested in, you know, installing heat pumps or getting an induction stove or electric car uh, or just finding out what are some of the programs available to you, there's increasingly programs also that are available for low income New Yorkers, which is great. Again, we need to make this affordable and accessible to everybody. Uh, it's not only the right thing to do, but it's, it's the law that we do. Uh, as Jen mentioned, the CLCPA mandates that we need everybody to participate in this transition. And it's actually um, more affordable oftentimes than you think. And we have these uh, clean energy coaches that are pro bono uh, for you. If you want to set up a time to talk to them, Samrat and Tom are amazing and just incredible resources um, that you can, you can utilize. So really encourage you to do that. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a, a photo that I love, uh, two photos really, that show on the left-hand side on uh, 1900 on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. You can see it was all horse-drawn carriages and one car. And then on the right, uh, 13 years later, it's all cars and one horse-drawn carriage. And I just love this picture because it's a great reminder that change can happen fast. Uh, you know, we started with a lot of, um, you know, dire kind of warnings from scientists that I think many of us uh, are extremely concerned about and, and scared about what the future holds for our children. But we can take action today that makes a big difference and is going to enable us to make this clean energy transition in the time frame that we need to to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of climate change. So just a reminder that uh, we can have hope and we just need to, to get moving and take action and, and in 10 years we'll be where we need to be. Uh, knock on wood. Uh, so thank you all so much. Uh, stay in touch on social media. Reach out to us via um, email. We'd love to hear from you and especially would love to hear feedback uh, right now on this presentation because we are going to be, you know, circling up and making edits and taking your feedback and, and tweaking this before we go out into the, you know, wider world and, and meet with community groups and folks that are not necessarily up to their eyeballs in, in clean energy and climate like many of you are. So, so please let us know, you know what you think we should tweak and adjust and, and we will also capture all of your questions and put them in a Google doc and, and share that later. So we're, we get back to everybody um, who had questions about particular topics today, but would really love to hear feedback on the presentation. If you think this is something that you could utilize uh, we would, you know, really appreciate uh, your input. Uh, and I think Mick saved uh, or put in the chat a link to the form. Oh, and I'm going to put a link in the chat to our green jobs map, which I, I think I forgot to do. Um, there you go. <laughs> So, okay, and it's 157. So we're just kind of under the wire here, but I think we can go a little bit over if people, you know, want to give some, some feedback and, and input, or if any of the panelists want to chime in with things that we forgot to mention, um, take it away.
If not, we can also try to address some of the questions, but I know that there um, are a lot of questions that kind of get into the nitty gritty. Um, and I think we were sort of hoping, yeah, to have kind of in input on how we can use this um, or improve it for people who are not, um, you know, really involved in and in getting into the weeds. Um, so, but I, you know, what do we think would be helpful? I'm seeing some, some input in the chat that um, this was helpful, informative. Thank you, um, appreciate that. Um, what do we think, guys? Should we try to tackle some of these questions or does anyone, and also please, if you wanna um, raise your hand and, and give some feedback right now, uh, I can also call on you. Two people have their hands up, but now I'm not able to see who. Can you see who, Mick? Yeah. Um, hey, Kathleen, I'll allow you to talk. So, because you raised your hand. So, you are. Hey, guys. This, this is great. I put a lot of questions in QA. I, I apologize if I put too much in. No, it's great. Reverend, Thank you. Reverend Dr. Simpson, I had a question about um, how to approach the. Um, community, uh, spiritual community who may not believe in climate change. And um, I put that in Q&A a little bit more eloquently. So I was just wondering okay. about that. Gregory, I think being the only pastor among us, <laughs> <laughs> this question's for you. Um, so I think one of the challenges that we face is just having people understand the, the different ways people engage religion. So that's, that's a big, part of this problem. The other part of the problem is just understanding that uh, some people, it's, it's twisted into the politics and our job as people who are proponents of kind of uh, sustainability just needs to be to reinforce the message using science, using the things that we know are true to convince people if they want to be convinced of what is right. I don't think there's an easy solution or an easy answer to your question, but I think what we have to make sure we always do as people of faith is to stand on the principles that are just and that are correct and that are for all. That's how we approach it. That's my first step answer, so. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Kathy. Great, yeah, great question. And I think we would love to you know, use this presentation to reach out to more faith communities and and bring them along um you know if they're not already involved so important issue to raise um i also see a question about uh any any events planned for energy awareness month or weatherization day uh so please put in the chat if you have any events that you'd like us to share for that uh either with this group and and we'll put it on our calendar um, let's see, um, Susan uh, is saying that we need to get the utilities to make interconnections affordable for local solar development, and this could be emphasized somewhere in the presentation. Thank you, Susan. Yes, we definitely could put that into maybe, you know, the, the there's so much on the power sector that Andrew went into, but like next steps for how we keep pushing the envelope um, and, and building more renewables. I think we could probably put something in there uh, for sure. So that's great, um, great feedback. Um, do any of the other panelists, I know it's like two o'clock and this was supposed to be an hour, but um, are there any, any other kind of feedback um, or questions that you're seeing that you wanna respond to now? Um, if not, we can also, as I said, be sure to, to share the, a Google Doc with all of the questions and answers for people in a follow-up email. Um, but, but right now, is there anything that people want to address or just immediate kind of feedback? Like, do you think this presentation will be, will be helpful um, for, for your you know, networks that are, are not super involved in all of this stuff? Um, okay, I'm getting, this could be challenge, feedback from Peter. This could be challenging for a general audience to digest. Perhaps consider breaking into two sessions or pare down to one session and offer follow-up links. 
it is a lot of information and that's something we're, we're struggling with. Um, and I think Cal, you had some ideas about this, right? Yeah, so um, one of the things that we're hoping to do with this presentation is make it really modular. So depending on who you are planning to sit down and talk with or having us sit down and talk with, um, the slides can be shortened immensely. So if you want to focus on talking about buildings or if you want to give like a very, uh, just a couple of minutes about electricity, but mostly focus on transportation, that's definitely something you can do. If you're talking to a group that is a climate advocacy group already, you can take out the early slides explaining the scope of the problem. Um, if you're talking with a group that's more dubious, you can expand the section that's talking about scientific basis for um, climate change and then talk less about transportation maybe, but more about you know electricity or buildings. So um, the idea is that this is sort of the grand overview um, there's a couple of slides that can be added about waste, refrigerants, and agriculture, which are the three lower um, impact but still important uh, emission sectors that can be added in if you're talking to a group that wants to discuss maybe agriculture or agrivoltaics, grazing sheep among solar panels. So the idea is that um, it can be shortened to leave more time for answering questions, defining terms, um, just being more accessible to a less climate saturated audience. I hope that answers your question. And I also just see that Valdi has their hand up. So I'll allow you to ask your question, Valdi. Thanks for letting us know. So you should be able to unmute now. Thank you. Uh, thank you for doing this. It, it seems this would be helpful to a lot of people that don't really follow climate and renewable energy topics like you and I do, obviously. Um, but a few of the slides are a little too complicated and, I, and especially the circular ones that talk about the breakdown of how, uh, where, the, where our energy comes from right now in the energy mix and how that needs to change. Um, but I think what's missing is to get at people's psyche, even the people that don't believe climate change is urgent, they need to understand. And I think a slide should, or a comment should be added in the early slides. I don't, I, I, maybe I missed it, but I don't think you said that a study came out early this year from Harvard University in conjunction with three British universities that was published in The Guardian is among many other places too. I think it was in the Journal of Applied Ecology that came up with the conclusion that just air pollution from fossil fuel use is responsible for one out of five deaths globally every year. And that translates to 8 million people around the world dying every year and 350,000 deaths per year in the United States. And it's, it's from the illnesses you mentioned, asthma, cardiovascular disease and cancer, as well as dementia slash, slash Alzheimer's from the uh, uh, micro particulates, the nanoparticles that, that get, go deep into the lungs and, and go across the, um, the air blood barrier. Uh, so that would help if you added that in there. Oh, you did have it in there. I missed it. I was trying to top type some questions. Very good. Sorry. Okay. Very good. You had it in there. Well, there Sorry was a lot, about that. so a fair- It's very dense. That one. Yes, it's very like, It's dense. there, but we didn't talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, right. and, and the other thing too is that besides the cash subsidies that fossil fuels get in terms of their taxes, they also basically don't pay for the societal cost of all this disease and death that goes on. They basically let everybody else pay for that while they're getting tax cuts and tax breaks, custom designed to drill yet more and to mine yet more. It's pathetic. And then they get tax breaks to when they fund the uh, think tanks that spew propaganda that slows uh, the public opinion change that we need to get behind speeding up this transition. So it's really multiple levels of onion here that we need to explain to people how insidious this is. 
I don't know how we do that. It's difficult to do in a one hour presentation. Yep. I think, you know, we're trying to stay more focused on the solutions, but of course your point is well taken that, uh, and I think we, you know, we did emphasize like the importance of not subsidizing fossil fuels for sure. But um, if, yeah, if you can, you want to think any more about how we could incorporate some points, please, you know, email us um, and, and happy to talk more about that. Um, Ron Leonard is saying, you forgot the main point that is what's in it for me. That is what moves the agenda. Well, I don't know. I mean, saving our, our planet, our species, so, our, well, our civilization, I, I, isn't that enough, Ron? No, I'm just kidding. Jen, China. Actually, better on that point. <laughs> yes. They, <laughs> saving the planet should be a good motivator, but, um, but also I do think that, um, you know, we could, Ha have a slide that kind of pulls together all of the, and sums up all of the other benefits of these actions, because there are a lot of benefits and the health benefits were mentioned. Um, economic, the, just the long-term economic savings and um, you know the stability of, of renewable energy prices compared to the volatility of fossil fuel prices investments in our rural communities, jobs, all of that, like pulling all of that together. Uh, because if there are compelling reasons to do it, even if you uh, don't care about the climate, which just seems crazy at this point, but, <laughs> but there are lots of, lots of good reasons we could talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. And, and we could have like a summary slide at the end about why this is a good idea, why it's a win, win, win. Um, and I mean, comfort, quality of life for, uh, you know, indoor air quality and, and electric vehicles, uh, to your point, um, they do save money, right? Operating costs uh, are, are cheaper than an ICE car. Um, let's see, any other, it's 209, and I don't want to be a hog with people's time, but maybe, uh, anything well, else? Maybe I'll just allow JR to, John Rath to, he has raised his hand. Thank you, Valdi. I'm just going to um, put you back with the attendees. Thanks for joining us, and I'll allow JR if you wanted to speak. Uh, thanks, Michaela and everyone. Uh, I thought this was a wonderfully comprehensive presentation. I don't know that you're going to solve uh, everything for everybody with this presentation, and you'll probably learn as you do a few of them. Uh, I think a lot could be gained by doing a little pre-examination of the audience ahead of time and, and keep what you've got, but then pick and choose as you need it. Uh, the, the summary uh, slide that uh, uh, Jen just mentioned is, I think, a good idea. Just hit people with all of the benefits, and hopefully there's something in there for everybody at, you know, with a final slide. But good job. Thank you, Thanks, John. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> okay, any, anything else? Um, that we want to touch on or, or mention and and as i said we will definitely capture these questions and and get back to you uh with answers in a google doc so don't don't think we're ignoring you um just wanted to get some kind of fresh uh perspective while while it's still um uh, while it's still fresh uh the presentation so we know what to kind of tweak and and modify um and certainly that is a great point that you know, depending on the group, we can emphasize different aspects of it. And, you know, the main thing is like meeting people where they are and uh, both literally and figuratively. Uh, and one of the things that we want to do also uh, is like, for instance, when we're showing all the electric vehicle charging stations, if we're giving a presentation in Binghamton, we'll show the EV stations right in that area, right? Or we're talking about community solar, we'll talk about the community solar array that's in your territory so you can sign up for it. Um, I'm subscribed to one uh, here in, in Central Hudson territory and it's very cool. You get to save 10% on your electric bill and, and be part of the renewable energy revolution. Um, so, so many ways to take action. Um, any, anything else uh, that we should, we should mention here, um, guys?
think that's I think that's good for now. We can follow up with the questions and I put the follow up form in the chat. So if you have a moment, please click on that, fill it out. Again, we love your feedback and I will email everyone that is registered with all of the relevant links that we threw in the chat. So no worries there. And we'll talk to you all soon. Thank you for joining. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Take care. Take care, everyone.